thank these two outstanding leaders for giving up their valuable time to be with us here today and for providing this very clear and visible demonstration of the partnership that we are building between NASA and the FAA. So thank you both. Charlie. Peter Drucker observes that the best way to predict the future is to create it. Our keynote speaker today is someone who demonstrates that philosophy better than anyone I can think of. He is truly helping to create the future. Robert T. Bigelow embodies the American spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation. He's a visionary and a doer. Currently, he is president of Bigelow Aerospace, which he founded in 1999. Bigelow Aerospace designs, fabricates, launches, and operates habitable spacecraft for low Earth orbit, lunar, Mars, and deep space missions. All the while, he maintains active roles in several other global business endeavors. His background combines successful enterprises in real estate, banking and finance, and the hospitality industry, the perfect combination for developing affordable options for habitable spacecraft. <laughs> Mr. Bigelow is a man of hope and conviction in a recent meeting with Space Florida, he said, and I quote, this country is absolutely capable of taking charge of the future of space, not just bequeathing it to other countries and other nations. His theme today will expand upon those recent remarks, talking about the need for this country to take the lead and ensure its competitive edge in commercial space transportation. Bob, I'm looking forward to your thoughts on this very timely subject. Oh, hell, I'm supposed to have a bunch of good news, aren't I, after all that? So, and actually, uh, I have two messages today. One is on the topic that's on the agenda. The other one is I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about the FAA Office of Space Transportation. Uh, for years, our company has been uh, very solidly behind that organization as the, hopefully, as the organization that will be providing oversight uh, for the commercial launch regime and, and industry. Uh, we, uh, we are hopefully anticipating uh, a situation where there are going to be a need for uh, multiple launch facilities in, in uh, several different locations, uh, different kinds of space uh, craft and, and launch vehicles, uh, perhaps like the new, the new Shepard or, or some of the kind of architecture that uh, is not a conventional uh, rocket launch architecture. And uh, so we're open to looking out ahead and seeing that there are going to be many challenges for spaceports. Uh, new kinds of things that are going to create uh, uh, markets and uh, a lot of jobs, a lot of business. So we are very much uh, supporting the FAA Office of Space Transportation in uh, hopefully providing oversight. And I think with the advent of uh, low Earth orbit uh, business, which will be starting in a couple of years, uh, that agency is going to gain uh, valuable experience in, in that area. Um, <clears throat> About a year or so ago, I began to, to, to try to connect the dots on something that was bothering me. And uh, this gets into the main topic here of uh, the discussion. And I want to involve the audience in this a little bit here uh, as we go along uh, and, uh, and talk about this. Uh, it seemed to me that uh, there was a circumstance that was coming at us, uh, and uh, that circumstance could provide the opportunity uh, for, uh, country, for a country for China to actually uh, execute uh, the, uh, uh, the mission or the notion of owning uh, the moon, as ridiculous as that sounds. And uh, those of you that are comfortable about the 67 space treaty are saying, oh, no, no, that's not possible. And, and uh, so that, that has to be something that we can just forget about. Um, <clears throat> 
you know, a lot of things, interesting thing about history is a lot of times it sneaks up on you when you're not looking. And I think this is one of those, those kind of topics. Um, in this arena of uh, uh, considering the prospect of such an audacious situation of a single country owning a planetoid or planetary body or the moon, there are four things that I want you to consider as an audience uh, that are necessary in order to succeed in that. And these four things are, and we're going to talk about these. Motivation. Why do it? Is the moon valuable? Uh, in, uh, in China's uh, context, uh, what would China gain out of that? That's terribly important. Do you have the motivation? Is there enough reason to take on that kind of a challenge? The second is, how would China acquire the ownership? How would you execute that? That involves several different categories, subsets in itself. The third is, who or what would prevent this from happening? The fourth is chronology, when might it happen? So if we pause for a moment right here, I'd like to just see, because we're going to get back to this later, to see if I've completely blown any message here and I've managed me not to convince anybody. I'd like to see a show of hands on a couple of positions. One, who takes the position that this is impossible, it can happen, and you're comfortable with that? Raise your hand. Wow. <laughs> wow. I only saw maybe five or six hands go up in this whole room. Gee whiz, I, I was prepared for something a lot. Okay, so uh, we'll continue. <laughs> so on, on the other hand, I guess by default, uh, we could say like 99% of you, is that true? I mean, do, do, uh, raise your hand. Do you think this is something that is possible, worth being concerned about, and, and what? All right. Okay. Well, gee, I could just sit down now. I, I, <laughs> okay. There goes some of the wind out of my sales pitch here. Uh, all right. Well, let's talk about motivation. <laughs> okay, why, uh, uh, what is there about the moon that is or would be valuable to the Chinese from an ownership position? So uh, let's, let's uh, and, and when you speak up, raise your hand and talk loudly so that everyone can hear. Let's come up with some of, some of the, the criteria of why would the owner, owning the moon be valuable? Yes, sir. Likely. Okay, so let's go back to the original question. How it is, is the, how many of you think that it is totally unlikely? Not totally, just unlikely. <laughs> totally. <laughs> That's the point. That's the point, Bob. You know, it's always hard if you've got a mixture of engineers or accountants. <laughs> you've got to be right on point. Okay, well, you kind of get the idea, the drift of where I'm coming from here, is that this is something that isn't likely to happen, and, uh, and there's a hand. Okay, okay, so we have you. So you need to be with the other six people. Okay, okay. all right, so I, I point taken, point well taken. All right, so anyway, we, the majority of folks, we kind of recognize that this is something that has possibility connected to it. And so if we're going to be looking at that, let's analyze that. And, and try to put some fidelity to that possibility. So if we start to go down the list of why, what does a moon have in the way of value? Why would it be valuable to the Chinese? Let's hear some ideas here. Who? Yes. Energy. Energy. What kind of energy? Solar energy beam back to Earth. Okay. Yes. Fuel and water. Fuel and water. What kind of fuel? Uh, the hydrogen the water. Okay. Yes, sir. Or ma'am. Prestige. <clears throat> I want to come back to you in just a little bit. You've hit us something that's uh, not the normal chain of things, but it happens to be very important. What else? Yes, sir. Helium-3. Helium-3. Okay. Of which they say there are about 20 million metric tons of helium-3. And by some estimates, it takes about 7 tons to run all the energy needs for the United States for one year. Yes, sir. Oxygen. Oxygen. How's that? The lunar soil is like 40% oxygen, I believe so. 
Okay? And what would you and what would you do with that? On the lunar surface. Okay? Alright? Yes. Strategic high ground. As a jumping off place to the rest of the solar system type of thing? Or looking back at Earth. Or looking back at Earth. Okay? Yes. I was going to rephrase it and say military position. Ah. An aggressive individual here. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. What else? Way in the back. Yes. In what? In what way? Okay. All right. So real estate has various kinds of uh, of opportunities in ways of. Uh, of uh, profitability, creating profitability. Well, whoop, all the way in the back. Platinum group metals. I'm sorry? Platinum group metals. Okay. So the, the um, processing of maybe rare earth metals or valuable materials there. Yes, sir? I'm sorry? Okay, so you're charging for permission to land or to occupy or to whatever. Yes? Deep space uh, exploration opportunities, just the lower gravity and the dark side of the moon for, you know, uh, jogging and uh, Kind of in the springboard context that we mentioned uh, before, similar to that. Okay? Yes, sir? Colonization. Pardon me? Colonization. Colonization. To, to uh, protect the species or something, or or just to have fun there. Or, okay. Yes. Kind of the same lines. Uh, hoteling and tourism. Hoteling and tourism. Okay. Good. Yes, sir. All the way in the back. Knowledge. Knowledge. Okay. So research, uh, researching that uh, leads to uh, confirming uh, the consistency of the Earth, maybe, and trying to draw some kind of connectivity to to both bodies or. What in particular, and what kind of knowledge are you talking about? Scientific. Scientific, okay. Yes, sir? To challenge and inspire their population. Okay. Uh, you and her have something very important in common in what you're touching on. Anybody else into indigenous resources on the moon, any of those kinds of things? Okay, well, you've all been, you know, you, you've hit on all the major kinds of things. Yes, one more, please. Heck of a billboard. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a, yes, okay. So we, we have, we have then in the real estate context, they could, uh, they could even sell tracts of land, uh, they could grant licenses to uh, General Electric to provide surface power or to uh, another company to provide uh, surface transportation. Uh, so in, in the real estate context, uh, you have a lot of control over uh, leasing laboratory facilities or, uh, you know, all kinds of things. Um, the, the other two folks hit on something that's extremely important and I think overshadows uh, all the other categories individually, and that's something called national pride. Uh, it's huge. Um, we still have it. Uh, based on six landings that occurred 40 years ago. And we're still, we're basking in the glow of that, so it's enormously powerful, and we're still basking in the glow of that, and we'll continue to. And yet there's no ownership, the United States doesn't own one square foot. So national pride is a huge driver. Um, you know, by the, by, uh, the time this would occur, the Chinese population is about a billion and a quarter now, maybe it'll be a billion and a half at the time. And uh, that, that's an enormous uh, motivator. Um, in fact, that, that, what that does is it's an uplifting thing for uh, not only the people in China, but everyone who is Chinese, spread out all over the planet. That is something that, that it makes you so proud, it's hard to put into a proper uh, language context. Um, <clears throat> I think there is a, I think there is a, uh, a second um, reason, though, and I think it is actually more powerful than the 
pride that a nation that uh, derives, and I think that is a global psychological impact. It's kind of the tsunami of maximizing uh, a, a new, even imperialistic kind of global image, something really supreme. Uh, this would probably, that image would probably last for a very long time. It's kind of something that happens maybe once in a millennia in the, in the history of mankind. Um, so I think it's hard to, to underestimate the huge power and I think it would, it would be a, uh, a fork in the road where history would look back and said that that was a major event for the human race, for a, a nation to take over control of something like the moon. And I, I think then what happens is in the eyes of every other country in the world and all of humanity, uh, China would be elevated to a phenomenal level, phenomenal, uh, put on a, a tremendous pedestal. Any thoughts about that? I want to get the audience involved. Any, any kind of commentary on, on the power of image, the, the national pride? We do a lot of things as a nation for those kinds of reasons. Uh, countries have all done things that uh, are directly related to the context of when you try to project power and, and uh, you, you, you're doing that in a context that is believable. And you want your people to believe it. Yes, sir? Oh. Historically, this view is decades long. Yes, it is. Focus on the next quarter. Yes, it is. And we're going to get into that. Uh, that ability to focus is very important in order to carry an agenda for a period of time. Back in the back. That's right. And they had the largest ships in the world, and what did they do? They burned the fleet. Yeah. And then they burned the records. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, we have <clears throat> we have a lot of reasons and motivation that 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 body, the moon, is valuable, and and maybe the the arguably the most important could be for why you're doing that from a a national pride context to also impose in the minds of everyone else just how significantly influential and powerful you are as a country. Now, the second area was how do you execute this? How do you acquire ownership and what is it that China would need? Now, we have several different areas. Uh, we have financial resources, obviously, and influential, uh, international influences. The statistics are so huge. I, I have a ton of different kinds of statistics, and I was going to prevent, uh, present overheads, but there wasn't time. Uh, there was just so much data. Uh, China's, China's current growth rate is 9.6 percent. The United States is 2.6 percent. Um, China implemented a, 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 a policy in 2001 called Going Global. And what the result have, has been of that so far is that they have embedded themselves uh, very well into uh, many continents, many nations around the world in, in, in a lot of different ways. Um, and so that, that is a, a, and we can get back into that uh, a little bit later. Um, and so as a market, they're extremely important. China has no debt. China has two and a half to three trillion dollars in cash. Uh, China is the world's largest importer and the world's largest exporter. Uh, China is the second largest economy as of uh, early in 2010. Goldman Sachs predicts that by 2050, China's uh, GDP will be uh, $70 trillion and the United States $37 trillion. $70 trillion against $37 trillion. So what if even uh, Goldman Sachs is off by a little bit? Uh, <laughs> The delta is still <clears throat> tremendous. Um, America has uh, 14 to 15 trillion dollars in debt and no cash. 
Everything we spend is financed. 100% of anything we do as a government is financed. We have no liquidity. China also is starting a new policy. Um, as I was working on, the, my wife bought a, a, a cabinet for a new TV that we haven't bought yet, but she has a cabinet. And it's in the cardboard box. And I'm sitting there at my desk, and I'm writing things out here, and I'm looking over, and the damn thing's made in China. So everything you see is, is made in China. Well, there's a new policy going on. Uh, and it's going from made in China to being innovated in China. I'm old enough to remember uh, back in the 50s when the Japanese were first making electronic devices, transistor radios, and those kinds of things. I'm seeing a few heads nod, and uh, they weren't that good a product back then. You know, they were just getting started with this kind of techie stuff. They weren't that good. But boy, it didn't take long for them to start to make really good products. Really good products. So you can't say, well, gee, you know, the, the Chinese are not going to innovate. Oh, no, they sure are. They have universities that are equal to Stanford and, and Harvard. They graduate 600,000 engineers a year. We graduate 70,000 a year. Sooner or later, that, that has to have an effect. China holds 25% of all foreign-held American debt, which translates into 10% of the total. So there's old saying, you know, no bucks, no buck, uh, no buck watchers. No buck <laughs> Rogers. If you have the bucks, you can buy the buck Rogers. Some also say that the United States is in a delicate period of time here. With this recession, uh, it is, it has, uh, it made it, it's made it much more tricky to uh, establish our economic footing, our economic, political, and military footing, actually. So we get into technological capability, uh, we, then we say, well, gee, let's look at their space program, China's space program. China, um, had, uh, Mike Griffin in, in 2007 said something to the effect, well, when we get back to the moon, they're probably going to be greeting us. Uh, but I don't think he thought of it in the context of they're going to own the ground that he's standing on. Um, uh, Chang'e 2 is a lunar probe launched uh, in 2010. It is going to uh, conduct mapping and uh, possibly execute soft lunar landings. <coughs> Uh, I won't get into the military aspects of uh, stealth fighters and bombers and cruise missiles and those kinds of things, staying with the, with the space area. Um, uh, China conducted two, executed two maneuvers, two satellite maneuvers in 2010. Uh, some reports were they, they may have uh, come within 200 uh, meters of each other, and, um, and it was for uh, observational purposes. Um, and perhaps uh, testing um, software hardware for docking purposes. Uh, Tagong uh, launching their, their, their sta station is uh, Tagong, I believe is how you pronounce it, is the uh, first component that has to be launched in 2011. Chang'e 3 to be launched in 2013 is intended to be the first unmanned lunar landing craft. 2017 is the sample return mission from the moon. How many here showing a, a show of hands again? How many here would say that uh, in another dozen years, China might have a technical capability to execute uh, landing people on you know, facilities eventually being built on the moon? Wow. Okay. Um, singing to the choir here. Um, let's get into the area about execution. Does China have the ability to stay focused? Can they plan ahead? Do they have a reputation for that? They do have a good reputation for that. So they could maintain that agenda. Now it's not as though, keep in mind here, I'm not saying I've, I've <clears throat> come across anything of this sort that, that it, it speaks to this, I, this notion. All I'm doing is connecting some dots that I think are absolutely fascinating. Really, really fascinating. 
And I, I find it extremely interesting that if you start to look at all the different areas here and what that country uh, is capable of doing today, much less, what, another dozen years or pick a time frame, it's just extremely fascinating. So I'm not saying that this is, a, is an agenda. If it were an agenda, it would never be talked about or discussed. I'm convinced it would be denied. Why, what's the, the advantage for admitting such a thing? You'd probably land there and then admit uh, that uh, you're, you're going to do that. Um, so uh, I'm, not, I'm not at all saying that this is a given. I'm just connecting the dots here. Let's get to the third area of, um, or the fourth area rather, an actual execution of reaching the moon. Uh, that would require uh, teams of folks, rovers, lunar rovers, and you might start a surveying kind of process. And if you wanted to do it in a, in a very thorough way, that would be the way that you, you uh, carve out ownership of the tracts of, of land and, and uh, start that process. Let's get into the area of who or what would prevent this. You're, you know, so <clears throat> let's talk about legal permission, the 67 Space Treaty. Some folks uh, of legal background feel that this uh, treaty uh, no longer uh, holds the, the value that it initially did. Uh, there's some uh, dispute as to whether even Russia, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, actually uh, codified and memorialized a new, a new agreement and signed a, uh, uh, a document that would tie them back to the 67 Treaty. But if you look at that 67 Treaty, and you look at Article 16, it's two sentences long, and it has to do with withdrawal. And all it simply says is that any party to, to the agreement simply sends in a notice of withdrawal, and one year from receipt of that notice, you're out. There's nothing else that has to be done. It's really quite civilized. So, so you have a situation where uh, you, you, can, you can back out if you want to really do it properly, you know, to where people can't point fingers if you should care about that. If you are truly a huge, a powerfully economic society, uh, you know, then, then you can point to that. If you look at, well, the, the uh, United States is going to be uh, involved in, in preventing that or some other countries, what do you do? The reason that General Motors was, was, uh, had a profit was because they sold more cars to China than they sold to the Americans. I think we have somebody in the audience or two from Boeing here. They're really happy because they signed a $19 billion contract to sell airplanes to the Chinese. They're going to be buying 4,300 airplanes over the next 15 years or so. Except they may be using the C919 uh, to satisfy a large quantity of that 4,300 aircraft, which Boeing, Pratt Whitney, and other American companies over the next five years are helping China to build because it's a lot of business. But it's a cash 22. It's a cash 22 problem. You have billions and billions of dollars uh, potentially to earn, but in the meantime, uh, they're going to be coming away with an aircraft that can be sold at at a probably pricing that is significantly less than the 737 or other Airbus products or Boeing products can be sold for. So we've seen this happen before with foreign markets. So there are a lot of things here to consider. But when, it, when, when it, somebody, when a country is that large of an importer of goods, you don't tell them to go pound sand, uh, just willy-nilly. It's, it's a very serious thing. <clears throat> so we have the international public opinion. Um, China is uh, hugely successful in many, many countries, uh, and including the United States. And uh, this Going Global uh, program that they started in 2001 has worked very well. And uh, so um, uh, I think that. Uh, we don't, have, we don't have a situation where the United, the United States would say, no, you, you just can't do, go do this. Now, you're not going to conduct World War III out of this. What, what's, the, what's the response supposed to be? What do you do? You're not going to go shoot anybody. You're not going to conduct a war. You're not going to put an embargo on anybody. You're gonna, not going to refuse to lend them money. Yeah. You know, 
What, you're not going to refuse to sell them products. What are you going to do? Yes? You take them to court? You take them to court. <laughs> <laughs> what court of jurisdiction would you take them to? And if you and if you got a verdict that said that they were in error in some way, what kind of an error did they commit? Well, for one thing, we can plead that the provisions of the United States Treaty, Article 67 treaty is a foundation for the complaint and you withdraw from the treaty I I don't know how then you could be accused of violating something but even if let's suppose some court somewhere said that you were in violation somehow God knows how but you were how do you and they issue a judgment who's going to enforce the judgment what's that how many divisions does the international court have? You know, who cares? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, this is not logical that a judgment could be obtained under the proper procedures of withdrawal from the treaty and that you could actually ever execute a judgment. Yes, sir? Uh, I'm sorry, as a lawyer, I still have my to make my pitch in favor of the Outer Space Treaty. Just back up a little bit to what Art said here. Um, it's not that easy that by withdrawing from the Outer Space Treaty, you can then ignore uh, what has been built up for 50 years by way of customary international law. So from a purely legal perspective, it doesn't mean that you can easily get out of the obligation to recognize that also the moon is a kind of global commons. I agree, of course, with you in terms of power policy behind that and the issue whether you can actually enforce the law. But legally speaking, we should be clear on this issue. The next effort to try and answer your question would then be, okay, first of all, um, even China has, a, has an interest in being seen as a law-abiding nation, whatever you may think of the Chinese from another perspective. Um, so to the extent that they can comply, that they can exercise their interest within the current law, may not wish to step out of the other space treaty. That's already something to be kept in mind. Unfortunately, it has not helped that the United States has for a number of years sort of uh, toyed with the idea of itself stepping out of the outer space treaty because it was seen as, as hampering some of its interests in, 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 in outer space. Um, but there's another one, and that leads me back to your question. Law in the international arena is also a matter of public policy and prestige. And that's, that, that takes me back to the issue of want to be seen as a law-abiding nation. Everybody's always talking about China. Let's not forget about India, which will soon be the most populous nation on Earth, and which is the biggest democracy. They might be there too. So one way of making this stick, this legal obligation, is build an international coalition agreeing that the outer space treaty should rule on this. It's not a failed group. Uh, it's not a failed group. All right, let me, let me address several of your points. Um, which one to take first here. First of all, I'm couching this in the context that this is a possibility. Uh, I'm also aware that, that if you, uh, it's kind of like psychologists and psychiatrists, if you get a room full of lawyers together, you're gonna have the ability to challenge both sides of anything. I think that the 67 Treaty is a foundational document. And I think that it is, it contains within that document a prescription for uh, resolution of a party that is dissatisfied for whatever reasons they're relevant as to why they no longer want to be a party to that. So Article 16 provides for that kind of harmonious withdrawal. Uh, history is replete with incidences, many, many, many incidences where nations have not followed through on their treaties. We are standing in a country that has not followed through on its treaties with the American Indians many, many, many times. So, uh, you know, we, we have, at the current time, China 
is taking on a, a posture in the uh, area around uh, Southeast Asia, in, in the ocean areas, where they are uh, wanting to control more territory than some of the countries are com comfortable with, around the Philippines and so on. Uh, that could be viewed as something that isn't exactly, uh, you know, that conducive to harmony, but uh, they have their own national reasons for that. And uh, I, I think this is, you know, I have tremendous respect for the Chinese, first of all, for what they're accomplishing as a nation and what they, and the path and the road that they are on economically, financially, and productively. Uh, and I see if I connect the dots here, as, and that's all I'm doing, as I see looking out ahead, and I, I put a time frame on this of, of uh, and I was going to ask the audience, I think, but I'm, I think I'm probably running out of time here. I put the time frame on this from between 2022 to 2027. Uh, Russia has a plan between 2028 and 2037 to possibly get back to the moon, too little too late. Uh, I don't think this country could, uh, and by the time notification would, would arrive, uh, I think that that would only happen at the time that the Chinese are actually on the moon, that they would say, you know, we've, we've, spent a lot of, we've, we've spent a lot of money, we've risked a lot of life, we've gone to an awful lot of trouble. We need to withdraw from the 67 Treaty. Let's do it in a, an appropriate context so that, uh, you know, but then uh, if it disturbs a few folks, uh, we're awfully sorry but we've gone to too much expense and effort uh, to pass this up. Yes, sir. Mr. Bigelow, you asked us about why we think it's important to Chinese about the moon. Yes. And we gave you different answers, but why do you think that it's important to the United States? 